Our next guest is author of Code of the West, an award-winning short story collection. Her stories have earned a distinguished story citation from the Best American Short Stories 2016 and two Pushcart Prize nominations, among many others. Uh, she has served with Voices of Protest, an artist collaboration begun by the Guild Literary Complex that seeks to promote the work of exiled writers and artists worldwide through the International Cities of Refuge Network. The daughter of Palestinian immigrants, she is drawn to stories of the silenced and invisible. She has taught wonderfully misunderstood teenagers in Illinois for over 20 years and is co-founder of Bird's Thumb, an online literary magazine. Please give a warm welcome to Sahar Mustafa. me and thank you all for listening tonight. I'm going to read um, a short, short story about hookah called Shisha Love. You used to smoke the Shisha after a plate of your mother's stuffed cabbage or at Souk on Taylor Street together with your girlfriends. Now you smoke it when you're waiting for him to come home after he's gone down on his Lithuanian girlfriend. She has a thin nose and blue eyes you smell her on his breath, a scent strangely like the papaya-flavored tobacco you smoked once. His parents threatened to disown him if he married her, so he married you, a respectable Arabiya who wears fashionable hijab and attends the Bridgeview Mosque fundraisers. You pretend you don't know about that woman and wait until he comes around and sees you can be just as sexy as her and be his whore too, though you've given birth twice in three years and your dimpled thighs and ass are not as firm as they used to be. Your stomach is no longer taut. Your shriveled navel has lost its allure. Still, every night, you loosen your long wavy hair from a tight bun, letting it spill over your shoulders like the licorice juice your grandfather, Sidul Jadallah, drinks once a day in the summertime. In your eggplant and sage kitchen, you prepare the shisha. You stand at the granite island and scoop the moist and fragrant black cherry tobacco from its round metal container. You store it in the back of the refrigerator so Musa doesn't get his plump little hands on it when he's looking for his jello pudding cups. The coolness sharpens the flavor of the tobacco, like menthol in a cigarette filter. With a tablespoon, you delicately pack the tobacco into the small bowl. If you listen closely, you can hear it squish down into place, like footsteps in mud. You cut a square of aluminum foil to cover the tobacco bowl, then pierce the surface with a toothpick. Tiny holes for ventilation emit shame and failure, opening up like pores in your olive skin, though everyone tells you men will be men. He doesn't beat you, he doesn't gamble, Allah forbid. What Arabi man is perfect? He's a great father, alhamdulillah. He married you after all, count your blessings. In the kitchen sink, you let the faucet run cold and fill up the glass water base shaped like an oversized perfume bottle, a stolen relic from the chambers of a concubine in a sultan's palace. The glass is the color of an emerald and embellished with gold laurels. You attach the copper stem to the water base, then screw the tobacco bowl to the top of the stem and connect the braided hose to its side. You wrap your fingers around the shaft, cradling the base in your other hand as you carry the shisha out to the balcony and carefully set it on the concrete floor. You sit on one of the wrought iron pub chairs, a pair with a matching table that you knew would be perfect for the space, to watch the cars whiz past on Wolf Road and listen to the wailing horn of an evening commuter train as it deposits stragglers returning to the suburbs. You hear the crackling of their heels on gravel. They walk quickly to their cars, unlock the door, and speed out of the parking lot. The, skitty, the city skyline is a vague memory. With tiny steel tongs, you lift two round charcoals from a red box called Three Kings with a picture of the Magi on camels facing the horizon. You position the coals on the foil-covered tobacco bowl and ignite them with a butane <coughs> mini torch. Sparks dance across their spheres. As you wait for the coals to blaze into small setting suns, you head back inside and lean against the door where Musa and the baby sleep. Lena has finally suspended her 2 a.m. feedings though you never really minded being pulled out of a half-empty bed. You slide the patio door shut behind you and settle on your chair, 
checking your cell phone for a text that he's on his way. You look up as the night sky fills with stars. A breeze rushes across your cheeks and you take off your hijab because no one can really see your bare head from the street. You want to feel the coolness seep into your thick strands and caress your scalp. The charcoals flare up from the breeze like lava rocks and then die down as hope tends to do. You lift the hose and instinctively wipe the mouthpiece across your thigh, even though you're the only one who smokes from this. If he were there, he'd ask for a disposable mouth tip, despite other fluids you exchange twice this month. He insists he doesn't want to catch a cold. The first drag is supreme. It's like opening a valve and something more essential, more desperate than oxygen saturates your lungs. These spongy basins become heavy, but it is an exquisite weight to bear, not a load of humiliation that makes your shoulders stoop a little when people greet you at aid celebrations, their low voices fringed with pity. With each successive draw from the hose, the water gurgles in the emerald base until you release your lips from the tip. Your mouth is piquant and your lips full of promise as they suck in the black cherry smoke. It coats your teeth like a sugary moss. You lean your head back and exhale. Rapture, wondering if the Lithuanian woman has already come in his mouth. In one swallow of black cherry smoke, you too experience all the flavors of love until the shisha, Shisha's final embers fade into night. <laughs>